All right, so here is the second part of the first exam, problems 20 on the second page of the review. Number 20, write the converse, inverse, and contrapositive statements. Remember we said that the converse means we switch our hypothesis with our conclusion. So I want to start with the second half. So I'm going to say if x equals 9, then 2x equals 18. So you can see that I switched my hypothesis and moved it to the back, and my conclusion is now in the front. So again, the key word is switch for converse. For inverse, the key word is not. So you write it exactly as it was if 2x equals 18, then x equals 9. But then we want to say not. So on each one we say if 2x does not equal 18, then x does not equal 9. Okay, and then the keyword for the last one is contrapositive, or the keyword for contrapositive is both. So we're going to switch it and we're going to put not. So it's going to kind of look like the converse and then with nots. So if, start with the second part, x equals 9, then the first part, 2x equals 18. So it looks just like the converse, I've switched it, but then we also want to say not. If x is not equal to 9, then x is not equal 18. All right, number 21. What is the property that justifies the statement that the measure of angle A equals itself the measure of angle A? We do that a lot in congruent triangles, but usually with segments. We say this segment equals itself, and remember we call that the reflexive property of equality. Okay, that's used to say that something equals itself. Number three. What is the property that justifies the statement that if the distance from F to D is equal to the distance from G to H, then segment FD is congruent to segment GH? So the definition that says that equal measures mean congruent is the definition of congruence. And then are we talking about congruent angles or congruent segments? We're talking about the definition of congruent segments. All right, number 24. Use the algebraic properties to fill in the blank. 3x plus 7 equals 28 has been given to me. And so then from there, I can see that my 7 was subtracted so that it canceled out and my 28, 7 was subtracted, so it became 21. So I subtracted on both sides of the equals, which means this is the subtraction property of equality. Okay, and then for my next one to get from the 3x to just a single x, I have to divide by 3, and to get from 21 to a 7, I also divided by 3. So I divided by 3 on both sides, that's my division, property of equality. All right, number 25. All right, the first thing I did here to get from 2x minus 5 to a 2x minus 10, I distributed the 2 to both. Notice this side didn't change at all. It stayed exactly the same. This is the distribu distributive property of equality. All right, and then the next thing I needed to do to try to solve this is we added 10 to both sides. So that's my addition property of equality. And then last but not least, to get rid of that 2 and just become an x, we divided by 2 on both sides. So division property of equality. All right, number 26. In the diagram, name all segments shown that are skewed to the given segment. Notice 26 and 27 go with the same picture. So <clears throat> what I'd recommend is at this point, if you have a pencil, you probably would like to use it. OK? 
okay? So it says to name all the segments that are skewed to the given segment, and I'm talking about segment AC, okay? So if I look at all my other segments, AB, BC, BE, AD, ED, EF, DF, and CF, okay? And I'm going to just, oops, undo. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. And so we can talk about what we mean when we say skew. When we say skew, we mean things that are not parallel. So when I look at my figure, I can see that DE would be parallel to AC. So that one's not allowed. Also, skew cannot intersect. So anything that touches A, or so that would be AB and AD, okay? And then also anything that touches C. So that would be BC and that would be CF. So what's remaining is going to be what is skew to the given segment. Hope your picture is skew now. Okay, so everything that's remaining is skew to the given segment. So I've got BE segment and DE segment and EF. Segment. Okay. All right, and then the next problem wants to do the same thing, but this time it wants to do it with a different segment. This time we're looking at segment EF. So EF is this segment here. So if we do the same thing we did before, I want to be if I look at all my segments, doo -doo. okay, and I'm just gonna zoom that in so I can see what to erase. <clears throat> all right, the first thing I'm gonna erase is anything that's parallel because I know I don't want to be parallel. So EF is come sloping down to the right. So that's gonna be this one here. BC, I'm gonna erase. And then anything that's touching. So anything that's touching here at E goes away. Anything, so that's also, this one's touching at E. And then anything that's touching at F. So this one's touching at F. And this one's touching at F. Okay, so then the ones that are left, put this back where we were. Well, that's pretty, yeah, it's close enough. All right, so the ones that are left are going to be the ones that are skew, which is AB, AC, and AD. Okay, and those are all segments. All right, number 28. In each example, determine if the lines are parallel or not parallel. If they are parallel, state the property that makes the two lines parallel. So if I look at number 28, I can see I've got a congruent angle here and a congruent angle here. And those are alternate sides of my transversal. This one's my transversal. They're on alternate sides and they're outside my two parallel lines, right? Um, remember we talked about where the interior is. My interior is all of this. Those angles are alternate exterior, and they are congruent. Alternate exterior angles do prove parallel lines are congruent, so this is a yes, they're parallel, and my reason is because alternate exterior angles are congruent. When I look at my next figure, again, here's my interior, and here is my transversal. Oops, I get a line. And then my two angles are here and here. So those angles are alternate because one's on the left side of the red and one's on the right side of the red. 
and this time they're in the shaded area, so they are alternate interior. They're not congruent though, 180 are not congruent, but they are supplementary. Unfortunately, with parallel lines, alternate interior angles are not supposed to be supplementary, they're supposed to be congruent. So that means no, these lines are not parallel, okay? All right, let's look at 30. Number 30, if I do the same thing again, here's my interior. Oops. Here's my interior and my transversal. So when I look at my two angles, they're congruent and they're in corresponding positions. They're both above the parallel lines and they're both to the left of the transversal. So they're corresponding. and they are congruent, and yes, that is a property that corresponding angles are supposed to have if the lines are parallel. So yes, they are parallel, okay? All right, and then when I look at my last one in this section, number 30, if I look at my interior and my transversal, I have, these are called vertical angles and they are congruent. Now, vertical angles congruent, yes, that's true. That's always, always, always true. But remember when we did this unit, we said that the key thing is that you have something that comes from each intersection. If you notice both of those angles are at this same intersection. So that means that I have to say no, that's not enough information to give me congruent angles. That's not enough information, or sorry, to give me parallel lines. Okay, you have to have one thing from each angle. All right, determine the slope of the line that contains the points 5, 8, and 10, 6. So when we do this, <clears throat> Remember we said you're going to put the change in X or the change in Y over the change, oops, I forgot my E, over the change in X. Okay? And we do have a formula for that, and it is on your formula sheet. We say Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. When I do this, I'm just really careful <clears throat> to make sure that when I look at my y's, I always go with the second one first, so 6 minus 8. And then when I look at my x's, same thing. If I went with 6 first on top, I have to go with 10 first on the bottom, 10 minus 5. All right? So then you can just put that as a special fancy cap fancy fraction in your calculator, and when you hit enter, it's going to automatically reduce it for you to two-fifths. Okay, number 33. 33 is the same thing, and again, what I'll, I'll oftentimes I'll just start like this. It kind of looks like a big division, but instead of with um, dots for my division symbol, it's the subtractions, so that way I can see, all right, I'm going to just fill in my Y, start with the second one first. So 2 and a negative 4. And by having already written my minus sign, the black one, I don't forget that I've got a minus and negative here. And then I look at my x values, my 3 and my negative 6. Again, start with the second one first. Okay? And then when you can, you can, if you want to, you can change these both to positives or you can just type it in the calculator exactly as you see it. And when you get your answer out of the calculator, it's going to be positive two thirds. Okay? Number 34. <clears throat> Given A, B, and C, which coordinate will make A, B perpendicular to C, D? <clears throat> All right, so A is my point at negative two, negative three, so this one is A, and B is at negative one, zero, so this one is B. And I wanna make a line that's perpendicular to this one, so perpendicular. When I see this word perpendicular, I remember that the slope has to be an opposite reciprocal slope. So what that means is I need to figure out what is the slope of this green line. 
so I'm going to go from my point and I'm going to see what is my rise, three, and what is my run, one, and if I want the perpendicular slope, I'm going to change the signs. Instead of positive 3 over 1, I'm going to be negative. And then I'm going to do the reciprocal. So my 3 over 1 is going to become 1 over 3. So then from point C, which is at negative 1, 4, from this blue point, I'm just going to go down 1 and over 3. So down 1 over 1, 2, 3 down one over one, two, three. Or you could go up one, back one, two, three. Up one, back one, two, three. And so here is my perpendicular line. This is making a 90 degree angle right there. Okay, so now what we wanna do is just check each one and see which one is on that line out of A, B, C, and D. So if I start with A, a is at 3, 6, so 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Here's A, which is not on the line, so A doesn't work. D is at 2, 3, so 2, 1, 2, 3. Look, there's D, or B, and B is on the line, so B is my correct answer. I don't need to check C or D. Okay, if you want to, you are, of course, more than welcome to. All right, number 30, the last one on this section before you can start on section two of your review. It's the same type of problem. Again, I want to see with how I'm gonna get perpendicular. So remember the very first thing we did is we looked at the line that we were given and we found the slope, oops, undo. We found the slope of that given line. So in this case, it's two over three, and then I can visibly see I'm going downhill. So if you forgot that you're going down two right here, look at the line and make sure you have the correct sign. If it's going downhill, make sure you make sure you make it negative, okay? All right, and then I wanna go through this point right here and I wanna be perpendicular, so I need to change the sign. So this one is negative, so this one's gonna be positive. And instead of two over three, it's gonna be three over two. All right, so from this blue point that I've already got here, I'm just gonna go up three and over two, or I can go down three and back two, down three and back two, down three, back two. And so I wanna find a point that is on this blue line. So I'm gonna start with A when I look at A, A is the point two, negative one. So two, negative one. Oh look, there's A, it's already on the line. I don't have to check the rest, that one is my point. Again, if you want to, you can look at one, three, here's B, that one is not on the line. Zero, seven is way over here, that's point C, not on the line. And answer choice D, one, four, there's answer choice D, not on the line. So A is my correct answer. All right, go ahead and start working on your second part of your exam, and tomorrow we'll review the second part, and you'll be all set for your exams next week.